Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Professor Bob Shield. I'm the director of the Bartlett School of Architecture at UCL. It's uh, my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Sue Hamilton, who's the director of the uh, School of Archaeology, Institute of Archaeology. Uh, intros to lunch hour lectures are always very, very short because it's a short lecture and you're not here to listen to the introducer. So I'd like to ask you to give a warm welcome, please, to Sue Hamilton. Okay, just checking the lights are okay. Can you hear me at the back, please? Yeah. Great, thank you very much. Uh, well, my task today is to introduce you to a place and a project which I'm involved with and is based at UCL um, with partners which I'll list in due course. So what I want to look at and think about is the archaeology of what today is called Rapa Nui by the local residents of the island, um, but maybe to more of you, it's known as Easter Island. And I want to think about a series of themes in terms of how you approach the use of space, the architecture, and the construction of architecture um, on such a remote location, and how one can reach an understanding of it through a variety of interdisciplinary means. So I've put at the bottom that it's an integrated, interpretive landscape approach. So it's something to do with scale, it's something to do with meaning as much as function, and it's something to do with how you integrate research and how you integrate thinking to get to an overall interpretation of the meaning of space and architecture. So the project which I'm represented is an AHRC project. It's now entering its fourth year, which is its last year of funding by the AHRC, unless I can persuade them to carry on with us, which I would like to do. Uh, it's a project which, as I say, is based at UCL, but it has other co-partners um, at the University of Manchester and at Bournemouth University. Um, it works with other universities in the UK and outside the UK, which I've listed at the bottom, um, Hawaii Pacific, Cambridge, Highlands and Islands, Southampton, relating to a range of specialists and expertise which we use. Um, we have independent people who work with archaeological research, such as Ariel Cam, which is part of this project as well. And we work very closely on the island with the Chilean National Parks Authority um, and with the museum, which in short is known as MAPSI. And it's incredibly important, as we all know, when you're working in a place to co-work with the stakeholders in that landscape. So this is the result of all our co-working and thinking. But I want to start with some traditional views of Easter Island, which the general public and the wider popular literature tends to emphasize and be interested in, is often described as the remotest inhabited place in the world. Of course, remoteness is a concept. You can be remote in a prison cell, incarcerated on your own. Um, there's many forms of remoteness. So this is geographic remoteness, and indeed difficulty in terms of the past world of actually getting there. It's a, an island which is set adrift in the Pacific. Um, it's on the eastern extremities of the Polynesian Triangle, which has the Hawaii Islands, which are in the north, and in the west New Zealand, and right across on the far east, Rapa Nui. Uh, Rapa Nui is something like 4,500 kilometres from the nearest mainland, which is Chile, and its nearest neighbour is Pitcairn Island, which is famous for the Bounty Mutineers, and that nearest neighbour is two and a half thousand kilometres away. So there's something about human society and what it does with such utter remoteness, and then what happens in terms of transformation with contacts with the modern world. What Easter Island is known for, what Rapa Nui is known for, is its iconic monumentality. And it's known for these. It's known for stone platforms, which are known as Ahu, and on them, stone men, which are known as Moai. 
And that's what it's famous for. And maybe people think it's famous for its heads, but they are not heads. They are stone people or stone men, which have bodies as well. And I think that's very important to, to absorb and know. Even though it's iconic, the most remarkable thing about Rapa Nui is that the meaning of these statues and its monumentality is hardly understood. So that's really what the focus of our research project is about. Rapa Nui has a history. It first became known to European eyes on Easter Day, 1722, when it was discovered, as it were, by Jacob Rigveen. And he was a Dutchman, um, and he had diaries from his ship journeys, and he describes Rapa Nui um, as a barren place but he does describe it as still having some statues standing. And these are two key themes which run through constant popularization of Easter Island. Why has it no trees? And why today are its statues in the main fallen? So what happened to the society that built these statues and to some would be seen as devastating its landscape? So there's a focus on collapse the collapse of monumentality, the collapse of civilization, rather than the focus on the meaning um, of the construction of these monuments and how they fit in a wider understanding of place. Until I went to Rapa Nui, I had no idea just how monumental it is. Um, I am tiny. I'm not even as big as the nose. Well, I'm slightly bigger than the nose of one of these statues, but I don't even hit the size of the head never mind the body. In simple terms, they can be as high as four-storey buildings. So think of one of the Georgian squares of Bloomsbury. They are that height. The other thing I never really realised until I went there was just how many of these statues there are. Uh, there are something like a thousand plus of them that we can see. So it is monumentality on a huge scale. But is that all it is? And what do we really mean by collapse? Well, by the time that Rapa Nui was reached in the modern world and documented, it had considerably fewer people than the estimates of the first people who arrived. And we have, in fact, the last British expedition to Rapa Nui, by what we are now doing, was in 1911 by Catherine L Routledge, and she, it's known as a manor exp expedition, so she went out there um, in a, a sailing vessel with her husband, and she was basically an anthropologist. She recorded the archaeology and the customs of Easter Island, and she produced a book called The Mystery of Easter Island, and that's just stuck with us down to the present, The Mysteries of Easter Island. She says in her book, that there are roughly 250 people there, whereas at the time of the first Western explorers, we don't know for sure, but we might estimate something like 6,000 people. So what has happened to this remote place, um, which is it's happened between several centuries since its first discovery? Well, the one thing everybody looks at is deforestation. Um, Rapa Nui looks like landing as you come in on an aeroplane to a small Scottish island, um, something like the Orkneys, water and just open grass. But it's not like the Orkneys, it's much hotter and it wasn't always like that. And if we look to other parts of the Pacific and the Polynesian Triangle, we'll find many islands that have vegetation, which is much more as it would have been originally on Rapa Nui, densely treed. So what has happened? The population has dropped the landscape is deforested, and we've lost the monuments. Well, it's not quite as simple as they just cut down the trees, they mismanaged the landscape, and there's much current research on this, and one well-known counter-research to it just being people um, is the work of Terry Hunt, and he blames it on rats, and uh, rats would have come with the col first colonizers in their canoes, they are very prolific reproduction-wise, and we have many finds, and include, including ones we've found ourselves, of palm nut shells where you can see where the rats have bitten into them. So basically they can't regerminate. 
So, yes, people cleared trees, but it's the rats that stopped them from regenerating. So there's complexity as to why the landscape was cleared and what the impact of loss of trees was. Um, simplistic <coughs> ideas of collapse have ideas of um, impossibility of regenerating the soil, drop in production, starvation, um, results out of starvation such as warfare. Um, all sorts of things go through the mythology and we have statues of the period which supposedly look emaciated. We have tools that are suggested to be weaponry but when we've done wear use analysis of them they're used for sh shredding vegetation so don't presume things from the shapes of objects such as this obsidian matai. Um, but there could be another journey that we take in looking at it and this is the one of trying to actually understand how these societies worked rather than focus on the demise. And one could make a case not for starvation, not for warfare, not for collapse, but transformations and the transformation of the landscape into one which is essentially managed through stone. And there is a whole raft of information that our work and surveys have brought together that show just how well managed this landscape was at the time of the statues. I haven't given you dates, they were up there, but we're de basically dealing with about AD 1200 to AD 1600. So in the European world, it's a medieval society. It doesn't have writing at the time of the statues, so it is a prehistoric society. It doesn't have metal, it's a stone-using society. So this society, in terms of our mapping of its archaeology, is pretty resilient. It has numerous types of structures in stone which are there to manage the landscape. So the Harry Moai, which are labelled up the top, they're chicken houses. They had a, a huge interest in monumentalising um, the collection of chickens into these houses. Um, chickens are really important, not for food alone, but for feathers. Feathers are very much part of Rapanui dress and tradition. Uh, littered across the landscape, there are small umu, which are these ovens in which um, tubers, vegetables, fish, chickens were cooked. Uh, we have manavai, which are large stone enclosures to protect crops and trees. And what we also have, absolutely par excellence in Rapanui, are rock gardens. They mulched the soil with rocks. So once the trees went, the moisture was contained in the ground by rock mulching. And underneath these rocks, the fertility is greater. It has mineral enhancement because it's not been washed away, but it's been kept down, moist by the rocks. So there's something really quite dramatic about how tree clearance did not create collapse, but created a well-managed landscape in which all sorts of stone uses created a manageable agriculture. So this obsession in starvation and collapse is somewhat extreme. Another obsession is about stone moving. It seems to be some sort of merit of Rapanui that it managed to move these statues. So there are many, very, so many experiments. You, it never stops on how do you move a statue. Um, well, we'll never know if that's the truth. If you can move a statue one way, it doesn't prove that's how it was moved. Perhaps what's more interesting is, did they move so many statues? Why did they move them? Were they the only types of stone they moved? And how does the social experience of moving things create societies and networks between people, which is much more to do with the meaning of moving rather than just establishing how things were moved? Well, I think it's very important to emphasise that statues weren't the only things that were moved. And in fact, in many respects, they may have been occasional things and did not necessarily take up the bulk of human effort in construction activities. Rapa Nui is an island of construction and stone movement. And right across our survey, it's just becoming quite clear just how much stone was moved. So, for instance, you can see a, a plaza or a cleared area, Te Mahina, and within that you'll see large scatters of stone, and the clear area is in front of one of these monuments, or Ahu. They have completely cleared that plaza of stone. So they're landscaping. Construction is not just the monuments, 
but clearing landscapes and making space. Where do all those stones go that were cleared? They go into rock mulching. So they work together. You've had ceremonial monuments by the sea with stone statues on them. In front of them, the cleared land becomes the fuel, as it were, to then mulch the rocks and the gardens beyond. The other thing which I think is really quite dramatic and the arrow system is trying to indicate is just how much stone was moved from sea to land. There's a rocky coast right around Rapa Nui. It's covered in large, flattish sea boulders at its point of erosion. And these are moved onto the ceremonial platforms to make ramps, but they're also moved inland much further to make houses. And it's quite deliberate. There is other stone available, but the key is this idea that you move things, and in this case, you move them from land to sea. So millions of large sea boulders, which are picked up by one or two people, by chains of human connections, are being moved from sea to land. So the whole act of construction is making links between places and remodeling and changing and moving the island. So moving statues and how they were moved as a popular idea is a rather sort of simplistic focus. Uh, what about how Rapa Nui was colonized? Well, this I think gives us another clue as to things we should be looking at. Rapa Nui, we know from DNA studies, um, was first colonized by Polynesian voyagers. And the Polynesians had a great tradition of taking up new space by colonizing. Each generation would set to sea, and they set to sea in voyaging canoes. And once they, they hit land, they would settle, but the next generation, in terms of their ideology, would set out and take up new land. So voyaging is totally central to how Polynesian society works and it's voyaging against the current of the Pacific. So Rapa Nui is the furthest east they went against the current. And why did they go against the current? Well, it just means if you don't find anywhere, you might just about be able to drift home again. But there is this great sense of moving from west to east, and that west is home, and that completely runs through um, ethnographic documentation and modern documentation of Polynesian ideas about life. So I'm not going to go into detail, but I just want to emphasize, if you're trying to understand how space is used, it's not just a functional thing. You have to understand the meaning of space to different societies. So one route into looking at the Rapa Nui material is to think about how they see the world. And a Polynesian world is a sense of transactions, a series of transactions between the human world and the divine world. And that what's dangerous is the places at which they interact or come together. So this sort of idea of danger at the interface between the human world and the divine world, what they call R and PO, is very, very important to the use of space. So in many parts of um, Polynesia, um, a repetitive theme um, might be what happens to the dead. Because when you die, you go to the sacred realm in the West, which is known as Po. And in some places, they have jumping off points on the edge of islands where you go westward, back to from whence you came. So these are ideas about how space is used, which add meaning and are part of the meaning of the use of space. So what I've done in starting is I've tried to throw out and throw up some ideas about how people have approached Rapa Nui, how it might be approached differently, and some of the underlying ideas which go through our project in terms of understandings of space in a cosmological way, um, in a spiritual way, understandings of links between space in terms of moving objects and moving resources. So now what I want to do is just channel into how you can integrate that into looking at the island as a space. So the project is not just at one place in the island, it has looked at many places and thought about how they link into an island um, materiality or geography. So I've talked about the Ahu. These are the ceremonial platforms that a few of the statues get onto. Um, they're ceremonial 
in that at the back of them, the dead are put. And the dead are cre cremated um, in crematoria um, on the seaward side of these ceremonial platforms. The statues look landward, so they're not looking to sea. They are upright and looking to the land. And they're traditionally considered to be ancestors. So they represent the ancestors of those who are buried in these um, monuments or ahu. What's very interesting about them, if you take a Polynesian cosmology, is actually their distribution. They're not totally in the distribution I'm going to describe, but in the main they are, particularly the ones with ancestors on them. And they are right around the coast of the island. So they are the interface between land and sea. So they're positioned in a Polynesian concept between two different zones, the zone at which the dead go to across the sea, and they look towards the zone of the land and where the living farm, etc. And the Ahu itself brings together the stones of land and sea. So you will see on the platforms there are these big boulders. Um, the statues themselves are made from stone from volcanoes, both their bodies um, and their hats. So they come from land inward, inland location. So here's another perspective on the Ahu. They're at the interface between land and sea. They wrap that dangerous interface in a Polynesian cosmology, but they also afford routes between land and sea. And in the early stages of our project, we were looking at canoe ramps, which are paved routeways, which go down the side of these monuments and therefore are the setting off points to land and sea, or arrival points, um, and the conduits between this interface between two realms. And one of the key things the statues do in that context is they guard the route to sea. They're there as you leave to sea. They're looking at you. Uh, so in a sense, they're protecting space, they're overseeing space, and they're doing far more than just representing the ancestors or adorning a burial monument. As you come inland from the sea, keeping those things in mind, uh, we can map all sorts of structures and one of the main sort of structures you can see in these maps, the dark, darker showing up things, are houses. And these houses, which are inward from the Ahu, they too have very interesting and repetitive characteristics, uh, which our survey is building up on. First of all, their foundations are boat shaped um, or canoe shaped, just as, in fact, the Ahu or ancestors' monuments are boat-shaped or canoe-shaped. So you can see the foundations there. They have in front of them beach boulders, just as the Ahu have these beach boulders on them. Um, they have restricted points of entry and egress, which is the, the um, you can see the right-angled doorway coming out through the pavement. So there's certain similarities there, and you could just observe it, or you could try and pick out that idea um, of what this architecture is doing in terms of a wider idea of interfaces between different worlds structurally in terms of raw materials connecting different worlds. They're quite low houses. Even Routledge um, could see them, um, and she made drawings of them. So we have ethnographic examples of them too. Um, when covered um, with thatch, um, palm leaves, etc., they would have actually looked like an upturned canoe. Um, here they are as you see them today. Uh, why so much investment in the foundations when you just have these reedy structures? Well, if you get beyond functionality, it's the investment in what the foundation represents. So the foundations have holes in them which would have supported a bent wood superstructure. Um, and what were they about? Well, we know from some ethnographers that they were considered mainly to be sleeping houses. So that takes you on another journey. What does sleep mean? Um, sleep is a dangerous world. Sleep is the world where your spirits go free. Um, it's the world of the spirits. It's not the world of the living. So if you take that idea of links between dangerous worlds, then maybe these foundations are really essential. Not essential just to support the superstructure, but actually to mark the interface between two different worlds. Some of the drawings we have of these houses actually show that they're guarded by mini statues, not giant ones such as on the Ahu, 
but in little wooden ones or stone ones, which led us on another journey to actually search to see if these little statues still existed. And as we will see in a slide or two, they do. So there's something really important about the foundations of skins separating two worlds, between dangerous worlds, between R and Poe. And yes, we did find the little statues that we think guarded these houses. They're much more portable and they're in the museums, but they look just like the drawings, the very few drawings we have of these statues. So when you leave your house, as you bend down to see the house or bend down to go into it, more realistically in terms of the statues, you too will see a statue um, on your journey. In a lot of um, Polynesian societies, houses are seen to be central to your, your idea of descent. So you talk about house societies, societies where those of the house that are the connected people, sometimes they're genetically related, sometimes they're just people who are more generally part of the inhabitation of house space. So the house is central to creating genealogies. And our surveys of the houses actually indicate to us that they are ancestral houses, just as the Ahu were the places uh, where the dead or ancestors went. So it's just done quite simply by looking at the number of different stones in the houses, the number of times the joints don't match. Um, they're made of many houses. One house is the ancestor of many preceding houses. And there are up to eight generations of houses incorporated in these single houses. Well, to develop the theme yet further and pull in perhaps what's most well known about Rapini, the statues. I mean, how do they fit in to this world that I've tried to widen out? Well, one of the key things about the statues is the types of locations they come from. They come from volcanoes. And in a Polynesian world, volcanoes are seen as conduits between the sky and the underworld. Um, they're the conduits between life and the spirits. And Rapa Nui has some very dramatic volcanoes um, at each of its peaks, and they're all treated differently. Uh, one of them is surrounded in petroglyphs and is, as it were, wrapped in symbols, uh, and it may be the same date of the statues or later, but the other two which I'm going to look at are very much part of the world of statues. So in the last bit, I'm just going to look a little um, at what we're doing at two places on the island. One is Punapau, which supplies the red hats that the statues wear. And lastly, I will look at the statue quarry. So Punapau has its crater. Quarrying took place inside the crater and outside to some extent. To give you a sense of scale, there's a four-wheel drive down to the bottom of the picture, and then there's a line-ish of hats going up into the crater. So these hats are bigger than four-wheel drive cars. So they are massive um, points of construction. If you take an idea of collapsed societies, an interpretation of this would be that those hats lying outside the quarry were just abandoned. The society just couldn't have the resources of the wood to move things anymore, so they were abandoned. So we'd, what we're interested in doing is trying to understand how working took place at that quarry and how much of it's purely functional and how much of it potentially relates to it being a sacred place or a conduit between different worlds. So we're doing all sorts of things that try and um, laser scan and 3D the surfaces of the quarry and look at what's underneath it in terms of areas of resistance, none of which I can go into detail, but it's all done from the surface um, and, and using different electrical receivity methods to look at what's beneath the ground. And what we can quite clearly see is that there are routes into that quarry and routes within it that are not previously known or mapped. And you can see it from the high resistance of compacted ground. And those routes, particularly on the outside, suggest that these hats are not just randomly abandoned, they are lining the route into the quarry. Um, so what are they doing? Why are they left there? And one of our earliest excavations was to look at that. Um, and it's quite clear that they haven't just been randomly abandoned. They're actually placed. They're placed in hollows 
to set them deliberately to the side of the road. So you could suggest that these are not just abandoned hats, but they're actually marking out a purposeful way, or if you want, a ceremonial way, into the quarry. Um, this one, for instance, in excavation, had a very carefully placed, extremely nice obsidian adze at its base. Um, not something you'd use for working stone, um, but something that's really been put there as a foundation deposit to a deliberately laid out um, hat along the route. Uh, so we began to think about these ideas as this is a sacred place, that quarrying, which it is in very many Polynesian examples, is a sacred activity. And towards the end of our work at Punapau, uh, what we came across was these. Um, and there actually are two eyes carved in the quarry face. They're monumental, and you, you can follow these eyes as you look around the quarry. As you look into the crater, these eyes would have been there. Uh, and eyes in, are suggesting life. And in Polynesian society, for instance in the Marquesas, rock is considered to be living. So when you quarry it, it grows again. And there are specific quarrying tools, there are taboos about who can quarry and who cannot. So we have a sort of root of another way of looking at this. Alongside it, we will be getting some of the, the first dates for the quarrying there. So there's sort of scientific information going alongside it. But I'm moving speedily to give you an island-wide view of what's happening. So I want to move on to the most famous site of Rapanui, which is Rane Raraku. Rane Raraku is another of these volcanoes. They're not active, they're deep time geology volcanoes, but they provide rock which is appropriate to the statues and their hats. So Rane Raraku is the main quarry for the statues. As you can see in the image in front of you, one whole side of that quarry has collapsed. It has been quarried away, so intensive was the quarrying. Inside, there's a very special place, um, which is there's a lake. There's virtually no water on Rapa Nui, but there are one or two quarry craters which collect fresh water. And around the interior, um, the statues were quarried there too. So here is um, the statue quarry from the outside. Um, a simplistic view would be, um, this is an abandoned work again. There's lots of statues left here. They haven't been taken away. Um, so a bit like the hats, are they abandoned or are they part of the architecture um, of a sacred place? Some left, but many do not. Um, out of approximately 1,000 statues at Ranararaku, about 200 ended up on ceremonial platforms. So the greater quantity of them are here. You can see upright heads. You can see behind it quarry faces. Once you get into the quarry faces, there are statues which are still attached to the rock. And they are so intensively attached to the rock, you couldn't get one out without destroying the other. They're much more like a sculpture and inscription. You can probably with time work out what you're seeing, but there are a jumble of statues and nosies and brows on that picture. So they're kind of nested against each other. Uh, once you move outside, you're not dealing with um, heads. You're dealing with set upright statues. And we know from uh, previous excavations, of which there are relatively few, um, that these were actually standing. So you can see in the pictures just how deep these statues were. Um, so they were left there deliberately. They weren't just kind of abandoned. They were set up um, to stay there for some time. And as they stayed there, the subsequent quarrying activity covered them up. And we know by other means that there are many more statues beneath the surface. So this is just an example of using ground penetrating radar. And then you'll see in the diagram above it a sort of little red spot, which probably means it's another statue there. So what were these statues doing? Um, they seem, in many respects, never to have been meant who have been moved, that they are part of monumentalizing through construction a sacred place or location, a sacred volcano. So can we see other links in the material which we've looked at relating to that? Well, just as a, a theme of link I want to just end and carry on with is the idea of eyes. At the statue quarry, they have no eyes. They are blind. You can just see an overhanging brow. When they get to the Ahu, to the sea, the statues are given eyes and they look inland. 
So there's a relationship between the, the architecture but also the concepts of seeing and not seeing between quarry and scene. We were interested in this idea of eyes because, yes, they have no eyes at Rano Araku, but there were eyes at Punapau carved on the wall of the quarry. So two years ago, we began an extensive survey to start looking for eyes in the quarry of Rano Araku. And we surveyed, and we are still surveying, all the quarry surfaces, all the walls out of which these statues um, were taken. And this is being done by pole photography, by aerial cam, and 3D photography, sort of overlapping images, and done by just looking, eyesight too, using the, the guides within the quarry. And to our amazement, there are eyes all over Ranararaku quarry. And they are the eyes of seeing Moai. They are the same shape, they're elliptical, and they are quite monumental, but they're really quite difficult to see. I mean, they're in dire threat, and so we're mapping them, um, photographing them, and recording them by various means. But without me spending time on too much description, I think you can see they're elliptical. They appear to be in pairs, but sometimes singularly, and in some cases we may have lost them. But the walls of the quarry are living, and you would have seen those as you came to the site from a distance. And they may have been coloured, they may not just have been of stone, bare stone. And just some examples of ones we've found by 3D photography, you they're so eroded you can't see them today. But if you photograph every face of the quarry and put them together, then you will come up with more. And the third lowest arrow in the 3D photograph you see there, actually you can see there's two circular eyes, like the ones at Puna Pau, um, but in the main they're elliptical. Well, the final bit is just a few slides on moving, moving between places, because the one thing we preeminently have um, are a network of roads leading out of this quarry. And so the question is, again, are we looking at just something rather functional, a means of moving a few statues away from the quarry? And that's what's famously known as transport statues are statues which are lying on their side and are supposedly abandoned, the idea of collapse again, um, rather than that they have any other locational meaning. So we've been surveying the statue roads. Uh, they can be seen with difficulty except from the air, but in some places you can actually map and see them, and the bottom slide is of a marked roadway along which statues were obviously moved in part. But the question is, is this really what it's about? Are these statues um, which are abandoned? And since we're saying at the quarry that that's not necessarily what's going on, how do we interpret this for the roads? Um, as you get, if you map the statues, as you get nearer the quarry, they get more and more. So there's also something about journeys there, because actually, if you didn't see them as marking travelling away from the quarry, but in some way marking a journey to the quarry, they make it more and more intense as you get to potentially the sacred place or the origin of the ancestors. So we've been mapping what's along the roads, uh, again by pole photography, um, but also geophysical work, We've been trying to track the actual routes of the roads, all sorts of details which I just skim over for the moment. But take an idea to its conclusion, um, maybe these statues are meant to be where they are. Maybe they're not abandoned. So maybe they're monuments along the road. Were they standing monuments? And we do have an early excavation which shows some sort of stone platform at the base of one of these recumbent statues. So this is something that we've been working on. We've been using geophysics to look at the resistance of the ground by the side of the statues. And it makes a good case that at least some of these statues were likely monuments along that roadway and not transport statues. And this is something we've been trying to get at by other means. And it's become another eyes survey. Uh, because if the statues were standing, the way the water would drain across them would be very different to a statue that was just carried um, horizontally in transport. And so we've been looking at the weathering of the cheeks of the statues, which we know to have been standing for long times, 
um, and those of the, the collapsed or abandoned or whatever they are and statues along the road. And in simple terms, by looking and using 3D photography, we can look at erosion. And again, I think there's a pretty strong case that these statues were certainly standing for quite some time before they were in the toppled positions of today. So we transformed these, potentially, from transport roads with abandoned statues to ceremonial routeways with upright statues to sacred places or quarries where the bulk of the statues stayed. So I've sort of given you a leap through Rapanui, but what I've tried to indicate is that if you look at something as defined and adrift as Rapanui on an island-wide scale, um, and certainly when it was detreed, you would have understood the island from any height on an island-wide scale. What you actually see is a kind of conjoined use of space, where certain ideas about the use of space interconnect and cut across areas of the island, be it how stone is moved, how eyes are used, how different components um, of the quarries and the ahu and the houses come together. So it's a much more nuanced understanding of monumentality and it takes you far beyond ideas of collapse to ideas of a society that could actually survive the loss of trees and had a, a very strong emphasis on understanding it as a conceptual whole rather than as we have been working as archaeologists in the past in little units of the archaeology of Rapa Nui. Um, to conclude, what about Rapa Nui today? Well, not everybody dresses like this, and this is our ritual specialist who comes at vast expense and leaves in a four-wheel drive um, and a pair of jeans at the end of the ceremony, but they are so proud of their ancestry, um, and they have all sorts of interpretations of it. Um, but the key thing that's really important is this landscape was owned by Chile, they is loaned by Chile. It became Chilean in the 19th century. Um, and its land was taken from them. They were herded into small locations um, and the rest of the landscape had sheep on it. So it's only since the 1960s that there's been a programme of giving land back. And what land do you give back and what do you protect? The statues are nothing to the whole. Um, you need to understand this landscape to get the local communities to map their landscape, preserve the archaeology in an interconnected way. So we are training Rapa Nuians, we are advising them, um, but that's what an integrated landscape approach can supply to the present as well as the past. Uh, thank you, Sue, for a really inspiring... For someone I didn't knew so little about Easter Island, I, that was really, really inspiring talk. Thank you very much. Can I suggest, with the time that's in it, if anyone has a question for Sue to approach her afterwards, because we, we've kind of run over a bit. So apologies for that. But um, I'm sure one or two of you might have some questions, but perhaps you could come up to Sue directly. Thanks. Thank you very much for turning up. <laughs>